Ladies and gentlemen, I am BDLM, coming with my buddy J4Y, bringing you episode number 56 of our Dota On Demand podcast, your source for Dota knowledge and competitive Go Fish analysis. What's going on, man? Go Fish. Ah, oh, that's, that's strategy number one. <laughs> um... Doing pretty well. I also mentioned in our Facebook that the main topic of this episode will be bananas. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess maybe we'll sprinkle in a dash of TI3 here and there if it can fit into our discussion. I mean, you know, you can talk about peels, banana peels, and then you can talk about how certain heroes peel for their carries. And that's a stretch. But Banana splits... And split how... push with nature's profit. <laughs> yeah, profit no, I like off it. selling bunches of bananas. It just did a full circle. Easy. It writes itself, really. Anyways, I want to give a quick shout before we actually get into Dota talk uh, here. Um, so a cu couple quick shout outs. I just wanted to say uh, thanks to Random Work Account and uh, Mount Pleasantaint. That's <laughs> almost. Dirty. I don't know if it was or supposed to be or not, but thanks guys for the Reddit feedback. Uh, we love hearing from you guys. I also want to give a quick shout out to Israel Ratto, who left us a comment on our last episode saying uh, that you're learning to play and that your these podcasts are helping you a lot. We love to hear that. I mean, uh, you know, not every episode is about uh, educating you guys, but you know, when we can explain things in more depth than what you just hear bluntly or like you know you don't necessarily gain the concepts you know i guess that's one of our main features is we do like to go in depth and explore those things so we're here to help and we're glad to do it absolutely it's it's fun too so that is also added benefit and yeah as you were saying this is probably going to largely and by largely i mean completely be about the international three here's your blanket spoiler alert yes. so we're going to be talking about numbers and who wins and heroes and how they perform throughout the tournament. And, um, you know, that's pretty much, I guess, to get into it and our just general discussion. Um, I know both of us are really impressed just in general with how the International 3 compared to the International 2 just in show. What the kind of stuff that they wound up doing to um, make it an experience. Something that I know we were both impressed with just last year, and just the number of things they did to make it better this year. There was, I mean, it, it go and actually being at the event live last year, uh, it, it it kind of like rattled my brain. I'm like, how are they going to even step up their game that much more? I mean, going from the first one to the second one, there was so much they could do because the first one it wasn't it was at Gamescom, it wasn't even their own event. So the second one they got to control everything, they got to see it out the way you want to. And the third one was the same exact venue. So you know it wasn't going to be an upgrade location-wise, even though it's a great location in the first place. They didn't need to, uh, with acoustics being perfect and everything in there. But, um, you know, it was like, well, how can they step up their game? Well, I've got a few notes how I personally think they did a great job. And I'll let you, if you have anything to add afterwards, what you think. But, uh, first of all, the new panel, they had four this time instead of the three. And they kept on 2GD and Bruno, which was just a great idea. Obviously, amazing personalities, a lot of humor as well, um, as well as they brought on Melk and uh, Merlini. And they really did a great job stepping up with their professional knowledge, which is what Bruno and 2GD don't have as much of, obviously. They're more for the... I mean, they have some decent knowledge, obviously, if they're on this panel, but uh, not to nearly... Melk especially. Can I just say, he really went into great detail about things that I wouldn't even thought of. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you right now, like, I don't want to spoiler uh, any of our own cast to come, but uh, there are definitely some, some milk quotes and some milk numbers that he threw out that uh, I thought were really interesting, and yeah, I mean, all those guys, I've always appreciated Mer Merlini's input, and yeah, I think maybe that's the most I've heard from Milk and his thoughts on the competitive scene, but I, I definitely liked it. They did a really good job, and I think just, like, the production level in general they had a couple hiccups where they had trouble throwing it back and forth between the the main stage and the panel outside but overall i mean stellar especially when you consider the upgrade from when you and i were there and you just saw the uh attempt to translate from chinese oh, geez. um <laughs> something something telephone something something <laughs> and uh uh it, it was it was really 
nice to see that just level of professionalism for you know a, a gaming tournament. It's and great. Speaking of professionalism, Casey coming in here. I believe she would normally works with a Seattle local news station or something along the lines of that. Uh, she literally had zero knowledge of Dota, video games really in general like that. And she came in here, but she had such a warm and fun personality and was able to have the, the back and forth with 2GD alone was she was able to hold her own and also be with these guys that obviously some of them, I mean, most guys, we are not all that stereotypical Red Bull sipping, pale, pasty, mama's basement kind of thing although literally i'm in my mom's basement but let's not go there Ooh. um but uh you know but this, there are some of those guys that of course were at the event and she was still able to bring out some kind of conversation even with some of these people uh it, it really was a delight to have her, and i'm sure uh valve's gonna want to continue working with her in some capacity just because of if i guess it stays local to seattle i'm not sure at that point but i know she was saying she was leaving remarks saying she would absolutely love to do more things with valve if possible yeah, she was great. I really liked her presence a lot. Just because, like you said, she was able to sort of bait some things out of people and sort of get them to interact. And they actively trolled her during some segments of it, and she just kind of took it in stride and, and kept rolling. And that was great. I mean, it, it was nice last year because, you know, we had people that were sort of in the scene. You had some of your casters and um, some people who maybe were less Earth, familiar. Shaver, but still, et cetera. Yeah, and I, there were a couple that I didn't even recognize that were still a part of the sort of Dota 2 community. So I guess you could say, oh, well, you no longer had that aspect of it. But she just did such a fantastic job. And, and not only just going around between the players and doing those interviews, but they even did a lot going and talking to the, the people that were there and going to sort of the the add-ons to the tournament. Um, I remember one in particular being the sort of panel for voice actors, the panel for um, people who had added things to the community shop, the workshop, and just sort of bringing that sort of stuff to light that maybe people take for granted or sort of that side stuff that maybe that's not what you went to go look for, but that's sort of what you realized was part of that community. The whole just, thing. In general. Right, it's the big picture, right? Because normally, if you're just watching the tournament, you're seeing just the, the the stage and the game, you know. And this is exactly right. They they gave you like the whole environment. They they went to the back. They went, uh, you know, just the whole venue, and you got to see the full picture. And that's what was cool. And speaking, I just I want to touch on it probably later, but why not now? You mentioned the the voice acting panel. Uh, spoiler alert: Ellen McLean, uh, who. I don't even know why I say spoil anymore. This whole episode's about spoils. Um, the voice of GLaDOS, um, if you are familiar with the title named Portal, perhaps. Uh, putting together what we believe, in theory, uh, a voice pack for Dota 2. Which, now, of course, I believe it was like when Dota was first even coming out in beta, everyone's like, that has to happen. That that just has to happen. Like, Everyone loves her voice. It's it's amazing. And, like, how could you not? This would be such a failed opportunity not to do it. But I think hints were dropped that it was in the works. And um, and apparently she's married to, I don't remember his name, um, but he does a billion voices for it. He does, like, Storm Spirit, Magnus, uh, Pudge. He does, like, amazing work. And I was like, wow, how cool is it that, like, these two people are, like, half the voices of this game already? Um, yeah, that is awesome. The other thing I liked, too, was they even um, brought out some of the art and just looking at some of the stuff that had been posted, the, the concept art for Heroes mm -hmm. yet to come out. So, I mean, they and another section was going to one of the local uh, pub stomp and checking in there and seeing how people were enjoying it. So I really don't know of anything that I would have, like, that they missed as far as that tournament, that experience going. I mean, they just did... Uh, a really fantastic job covering all aspects of the tournament. And then a few other things, so we can actually start talking real Dotas, but I just wanted to kind of mention how I also was pretty impressed. Uh, so from last year, first of all, I believe the TV was even bigger this year somehow, uh, which is already enormous from the first one, but they had even more screens for you if you were actually there watching. So not only did they, of course, have the main screen of the game from where the, the, the caster was watching, but then they had the two... Uh, team cameras on the side of it and then on the right side whatever statistics um, so you're used to seeing the, the drop down menus of like gold per minute or character level 
or uh, one more that I'll get into in a second, um, that, that was a little mysterious, um, <laughs> that uh, uh, you, there's just more to even uh, see, I guess, and more to really uh, take in as you're watching. So it's just more, I don't know how to put it, information? Yeah. That's cool. Um, and then also the, the hero portrait under each player is just awesome. So you know which player... I mean, like, you know, it, it's not a huge difference, but it's still kind of neat to see, like, oh, uh, HYHY is uh, Beastmaster or something, you know, and just go from there. Um, yeah, I really like that a lot, too. I mean, yeah, like you said, did that really, like, change any, like, you didn't really maybe gain any more perception of the game, but it was just a neat element, and it's it's so cool. I mean, I guess it's just kind of awesome that you have those sorts of things starting to come into it, those sort of... Um, extras i don't know i i'm thinking of like you have your stereotypical vision of like a football stadium of like the tunnel that everybody runs down those sort of just like extra features that you're just sort of used to seeing and uh, we've seen that sort of set up before with league of legends where you have the sort of the hero portraits in front of who's playing and that's i think really cool that that's sort of being brought in as now this sort of almost staple of the show and part of what you can expect to see now and just how that is developing independently of maybe other games and other sports. I was going to say that maybe they're getting some ideas from some of this Korean production value that they're seeing overseas. Who knows? I mean, some of these venues really like to go all out with their presentation, obviously, and that's what gets excited fans in there for live performance. So why not? Um, another thing that this is a small thing but actually pretty cool each player had their own hard drive to use for their computers and they swapped them out for each game and really the driving uh, force behind this was uh, the uh, last year each player to go in change their key bindings their settings to match exactly what they wanted with the hard drive you swap it in swap it out and you have everything set up to your preferences so it actually made game transitioning a lot faster and I could tell from the first one, you know, there definitely was some downtime. You would, they'd have to really go into talking about who knows what they'd have to make up. But in this case, you know, it just eased that transition, which is definitely could be a large issue with a game like Dota, where each player has, you know, you could have so many different combinations for your bindings or whatnot. We may or may not have had time to run and get waffles between uh, <laughs> best of threes last year. Just saying, those were good waffles. They were very good waffles, but. <laughs> Waffles and bananas, folks. That's what it's about today. Uh, but what did you think about the actual tournament? We're, let's get into the, the sort of the nitty-gritty. Can I say the... one thing? Yeah, no, no. Last thing. No, yes, this go. Is, this is the thing I was referencing. Uh, oh. So I was talking about the drop-down menu. Fantasy points. A huge element. I won't, not huge, but a pretty cool element they brought into this that has lightly been... It's probably been danced around in other events. It's, it's something that was even... Uh, accepted and uh, used, like, you know, as you're watching the game, one of the drop-down menus was fancy points. So you see, as the game's going, who's getting how many points for you? And I just think that's awesome. I mean, obviously, we know how popular fancy football is, all these fancy sports are online. You know, it's brought in huge crowds of people and, frankly, a lot of money, too. Um, and so the fact that eSports is trying to now actually recognize it officially like hey we can do something with fantasy values uh very smart and very cool and it also gets people to know the players better which is a huge thing i, I think a great way to connect them with uh the community yeah i i absolutely agree i mean there was the one hiccup i forget which a Asian team it was that was switching their player roles around a lot. I know that sort of created some confusion as far as fantasy points goes, but I mean, in general, that's not going to be an issue. You know, most teams don't swap that around, obviously, because it's important to have all your players know all their matchups, you know, particular to their lanes. Um, but yeah, I it's all that extra stuff, I think, that really helps make it such a, a crazy event. It's that sort of stuff that really helps propel these things sort of beyond just thinking of them as, you know, video games to being games or being sports. And I can't complain about another, that. Another for sure. bridge for the gap. That's that's all it is. Um, yeah. But yeah, as far as my general thoughts, wait, so you want to talk about prelims now? Is that what we're kind of, or just... Yeah, prelims, uh, thoughts in general, kind of main trends that you thought were crazy that you want to talk about. 
crazy. Well, I don't know about crazy quite yet. There was some crazy stuff in there. Yeah, you'll probably know more about that than me. But um, I, I definitely trends. I mean, we can we can we can say for certain um, a couple of the popular heroes, especially in the prelims, but probably throughout the whole event. Um, the Weaver coming in and just being one of the most picked or banned carries in the game, alongside, of course, with Lifesteer and Alchemist. They weren't going to go anywhere. Uh, that, and that's been a trend that we've seen building up anyways. Uh, and how ironic to compare that to TI2, where Alchemist was picked once as a troll game pick, and that was it. So what a, what a, what a, what a progression he, that hero has made <laughs> in, in the past year, I suppose. Um, Chen, of course here to stay forever. Uh, I don't know how he would ever disappear. And then the Rubik support. Uh, some teams loving him more than others, but um, definitely sticking around. And then Dragon Knight uh, was one I, I saw very often played as well. Not necessarily the most successful, but definitely used uh, pretty often with lineups. Yeah, I mean, I think all of those years really fantastic. I mean, I think the Weaver one was maybe sort of the more surprising. Um, just because we don't really see Weaver changes all that much, but all of a sudden here he was, just this super important carry. The other two that I really thought were um, just surprised me how crucial they became in so many matchups were the Timbersaw and then of course the support Naga Siren, which mm -hmm. I feel like just dominated the scene. It's sort of funny how I think you and me both were so sick of Naga Siren from the International 2, and I actually found her to be really sort of refreshing for the most part um, in this International. It, it was really fun to see. Who do you... Oh, and Razor as well. Razor. Forgot the That's Razor. Absolutely. You can't forget the Razor either. What who, else? I mean, answered one of your questions, you know, who can we expect to really stand up against the OD in the mid lane? Yep, he was definitely, uh, definitely one of the good choices, obviously, because, uh, you know, despite the... Uh, getting banished out of existence, that, that tether will still remain, so it's going to keep uh, sucking up that damage. Um, really a solid pick, and he was used just in multiple cases. Uh, I, we expect him also to be used to counter the lifestealer, not counter, but to have a good face-off against him, but even when there's games without OD, without, without um, lifestealer, he was still getting picked, just because teams enjoyed um, not only his ultimate um, but just, I guess, if he is able to tether up with someone and get, and I keep saying tether, of course, it's not tether, that's Wisp's move, but... Static think, Link! Static Link, I think we were all understanding where I was going with that. Um, he obviously can still be enough of a threat uh, to not necessarily be the main carry, but to be kind of that second source of damage for team fights that uh, will help out. But um, I really liked seeing him get picked up as much as he did. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting too, just the array of positions you saw him in. Of course, you know, we brought this up by saying mid, you know, he was just doing great against OD and just putting so many points in the unstable current, just making him pay for trying to steal Razor's int, um, and then being able to steal OD's damage, being able to, to contest him and not let him get that just snowball effect that OD has to have to, to matter in the game. I pretty sure he was in the off lane in one of the Navi games and I want to say also in the safe lane so really just kind of all around there and uh, the most hilarious thing I feel like I've ever seen and I know this was something that happened in Dota 1 I want to say this was the second time in Dota 2 history that it was done but the Aghanim Scepter Refresher Orb hmm. on Razor the single most devastating epileptic seizure looking thing you've ever seen in your life. Um, crazy, crazy. Smart too, and good. And like you said, and I didn't actually even know <clears throat> that that worked, that you could have two instances of the ulti at the same time. It's almost like one of those uh, <clears throat> armlet bear things where you're like, well, wow, that does work, and it's amazing. Like, uh, you know, you you don't expect a refresher on a carry very often, but uh, there's some cases where it works. I mean, I've seen also a refresher on Bristle. That is not the same case. <laughs> that is a different instance. But, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's worth experimenting with some, I guess, obviously, more than others. And, obviously, if he was able to get that much money, they were doing pretty good in that game, needless to say. Because that is an expensive pair of items. Um, but, even still, right, it, it, it's the Ogdoms alone 
was probably one of his most popular be- behind the Black King bar for that hero to get, just because of the fact that it late game let you help push towers immensely, which was very crucial. Yeah, I mean, I know uh, one of the things I thought was interesting is going back to the panel, um, Merlini at least said once, you know, Razor has been big, but is it so much the Razor, or is it what's happening around him? And I mean, I think when you, you go against the OD, you go, well, you're you're stopping OD. So I think that's important. That's where Razor, I think, really is, yeah, he is doing something super impactful to affect the flow of the game. But it, it was kind of interesting, too. I mean, of course, we don't have the ability to look and see how other heroes would have done, subbed in that position, but um, it was just sort of neat to see this hero that we hardly ever get to see, you know, is one that um, would sort of pop up, and you go, oh yeah, Nick, so popular, the Lifestealer, let's pick Razor, and it sort of doesn't work, but all of the sudden, everybody's like, yeah, let's run with it, let's pick up the Razor and, and see how it goes. I mean, it wasn't always successful, right? It, it, it You know, it, it definitely, every hero, there was no, I don't believe, maybe besides the, the one-off heroes that won their game and weren't picked the rest of the tournament, uh, for the most part, there was definitely some success and some fail. So, you know, you can't expect that. But uh, I, I believe overall he at least probably had a 50% win rate. I mean, he, he was very successful in the roles. 48. Stats, stats, oh, round up. Let's round up to 50, Let's shall we? Let's round up. That's, uh, that's a good idea. But you're right, 48, that's, that's not bad at all. I mean, that's pretty good. Hey, in Vegas, I'll take those odds any day of the week. You know, put a banana peel on 23. I'll, it's actually I'll, I'll roll it. Much higher than the OD, if what I'm looking at is accurate. So Really? There you go. Mm-hmm. I mean, OD... I, I guarantee... Razor was picked more than OD, wasn't he, this tournament? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, because OD was probably gonna, banned. Er, er, <laughs> oh, if we're just looking at just picks... Right. Let's see. Oh, no. Oh, no, you put me on the spot, Jay. Always do. Oh, wait. Try to. Maybe not. Um... We'll keep going. We'll see. We'll, well see. Well, anyways, <clears throat> but right, Razor, uh, uh, definitely a, a strong selection. Um, Wisp, of course, we can't leave the Wisp out. Uh, picked quite often as well. Uh, only probably by a, f- a handful of teams, though. Not every team necessarily diving in to get him, but he was banned a lot, too, especially against Na'Vi. I swear, it, it was almost every game Na'Vi was banned. And, and uh, funny enough, the only team willing, not really to, or willing to let that go through was Alliance, which... The conversation will snowball into later, of course. But um, Wisp, of course, you, you obviously can never underrate, underestimate him just for the fact that he, he and Pudge, are some of the probably the two of the top heroes that actually affect how you play the game the most. Yeah, I mean that's I think always what we've kind of said. You know, that's what makes him so man worthy is just the fact that he changes the way you have to play the game. And yeah, don't worry. There's 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 plenty of IO talk later. Oh, I'm because well aware. IO and fortunately not a lot of tree talk, which I'm I'm thankful uh, of, but yeah, the tree, you know, didn't didn't see uh massive yeah, amounts of them, but you know, which I'm like I said, thrilled to death about. Thrilled to death cuz all tree does is inspire uh passive play. That's all he does. So to not see heroes like that, to not see the Omni Knight, which we talked about last time, which we hey, kind of knew he wasn't going to be really making a making a show, anyways. Did get uh, picks? That's did important. he? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, I'm excited for you to tell me about that. I don't remember it. Well, but I know it happened. Well, great. Well, there's the end of discussion. But <laughs> but um, it well, didn't win. I can tell you that much. But speaking of heroes that were picked. 83, I believe, is what we told it up, or what the total was. 83 unique heroes picked this year. Uh, that's amazing. That in itself, when you consider there's about 100 heroes in Captain's Mode, and over four-fifths of them were used, that's showing a great stride of balance in the game, first of all, to say how many heroes people value and believe can be used. Um, I mean, yeah, there was definitely probably a top 10, where that were used a lot more than the bottom 30 or something. But, you know, at the end of the day, 80-something got used, and that's that's really great for the game. Yeah, I mean, th- this kind of is something that, again, I sort of wonder when we get to talking about the final specifically that I want to bring up there. But, yeah, I mean, of course you're going to have that hero that actually winds up getting, like, picked and banned, like, the whole time. But just the fact that you can sort of go across to the board and say... We, the greatest professional teams, 
in this game think that the majority of the heroes are at least useful sometimes. I think is great. I mean, of course there were some heroes that got played once and didn't win, so that sucks. But the fact that you're going to be able to be willing to try all these strategies when, you know, $1.4 million is on the line is huge. And I think a lot of those heroes, too, that we maybe didn't expect to sort of maybe make a, a huge impact that you may, might expect to make a huge impact really did. I mean, Ursa, and not just Ursa, but Wispless Ursa mm -hmm. picked up quite a bit. He was actually, Ursa himself was picked up five times, or seven times gets five wins. The Marana also pretty, pretty good, picked up a number of times. Venomancer, who is, you know, I I'm, haven't really been all that excited about lately, gets picked up a number of times too, so some of these sort of forgotten heroes wind up at least getting the rust off in the competitive scene. I, Yep, awesome. And awesome. may I just add, <clears throat> give myself a slight pat on the back here, mm -hmm. that uh, you got to do it when you can, because uh, it doesn't happen very often. My predictions for hero, the two heroes not going to be used, uh, Medusa, zero games Ooh. played, and <laughs> Tusk, zero games played. Am I right? So You are the stats Two man, for two. That's I mean, pretty good. Next year, I'll be the fifth member on that panel, probably, because how many people can guess that kind of accuracy? I'm just if you would have said Wisp getting picked, you would be some sort of profit. <laughs> well, at that point. Yeah, I mean, let's, who who could go that far? That would who just be could? ridiculous. That um, <laughs> almost certain. I mean, the other interesting thing, Magnus, can, he did get picked up a decent amount, but not as much as I almost expect. I expect him to be kind of used more often, and I believe he had, I would have thought, a decent success. I, the games, a few games I watched with him in it. He did very well for his team. Uh, it, he kind of is another one of those heroes. Doesn't he alters it? Um, he alters the gameplay, but not nearly to the extent of Pudge or Wisp. But still, if you're any kind of grouped up, Magnus is going to punish that severely with his RP plus skewer, um, and that would that was very uh, very obvious in the games he played in. So uh, I was a little I was a little surprised he wasn't picked. I mean, do you have that stat anywhere? 47? 48? Okay, actually, that's a pretty good amount. But it, it's the... Or no, I'm sorry. 45% uh, win rate. Yep. Uh, picked 11 times, 5 wins. Oh, 11 times. See, that's not very much. I, I would have expected a bit more, but... Uh, I guess he, he... Like, he, him and Sven, of course, were... Used to be the bros, and now... They've been left for the hoes. Oh. That's maybe not the worst place to be. You know what? True. Some some people do prefer the hose to the bros. I mean, you know, you gotta you know. go with what you got. I think it was great too that we sort of, uh, in being the the prophets that we are, um, the fortune tellers, we decided to break out that Heaven's Halberd question uh, last week that our our viewers were so nice to provide oh, us yeah. with. Um, and there were actually some some really great stats for the Heaven's Halberd, and uh, it's really sort of interesting that we we talked about it, and it winds up sort of being that go-to support item when you actually have money. Uh, Heaven's Halberd, first time ever on the Vengeful Spirit occurred during this tournament, and a 300% increase, really not even towards the end, so it might have even gone up from there, um, but that stat was dropped at one point, 300% increase of hmm. Heaven's Halberd on Naga Siren. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Stop. Well, that makes a ton of sense, doesn't it? And obviously that directly correlates with her being played as a support. Because Heaven's Halberd, as we've come to realize, is 9 out of 10 times on a support. I mean, the, the, t the chances you'll see it on a carrier are not very often. So, And obviously, that, I, ha I guess, has a lot to do with the fact that... I mean, we, we had this discussion when we talked about the item last time, but um, the fact that most carries are agility. So to get a strength item like that is not necessarily always the best idea. But, uh, yeah, that item was definitely getting picked up left and right. I mean, it was it's obviously very, very effective against certain heroes to shut them down, particularly the Lone Druid, um, but of course other ones as well, Alchemist and whatnot, so uh, just a solid choice on uh, the Naga support. I kind of want to just get into that a little bit. You want to do it? I want to break that one open a bit. I mean, I, I mean, do you have like a set notes that you want to start it with? or? Uh, no. I will say, though, that uh, I think it's really interesting, and it's sort of for me, feels 
almost a lot like the the Mal's alchemists from a while ago. I like to just bring that up because a I think it's interesting that that was sort of that a hero that we all are like, oh yeah, carry, carry, carry. And then Mal's actually wind up running it as a support pretty well. And in several games, he winds up being a support that's actually able to get some stuff together because he has this built-in component that sort of allows him to farm. I, I think it's really interesting when you look at the Nagas Iron. You go and you see the obvious reasons that you would pick her uh, as a support hero. The number one, I think, just blatantly obvious, like, hard counter slap in the face that Nagas Iron did was against Spectre, who would haunt, and then you song a siren, and then you laugh because Spectre does nothing with his ultimate. Um, but you just look at the fact that eventually she's going to wind up, once she starts getting up her levels, have the mirror images, have the ability to, to rip tide, to be able to actually farm decently well at, at some point when she starts getting up in the levels. And then she's also got that ensnare, which allows her to go through the BKB. So I think it's a really great adaption. Of course, bringing the rip tide cooldown down to 10 seconds is a huge part of why all of a sudden she fits into this role so well, but I actually really like it, and the best part about it is that teams have really broken out of the international two mindset of wombo combo, wombo combo, wombo combo. Now it's just, this is a great way to break up a fight, this is a great way to try and get some positioning, this is you know, just a really um, great tool more than just let's just combo, combo break. Yeah, I mean, I have to kind of say, I believe when she was going to use as a carry, like you said, it was with the Wombo Combo, so it was more used definitely for offensive, like a, as a weapon. Now I'm, I'm seeing it more, like you're saying, as, as breaking up the fighter, more of a defensive kind of strategy, or like, let's say, oh, their carry popped their BKB, pop that song, only the carry is now the only one that we can fight and we can kill him. I mean, there's like... Uh, great different strategies they've used. Roshan stealing, of course, that goes back to TI2, but, uh, you know, that had its purpose as well. I mean, so many great uses for that ultimate. It's so powerful, and then at the third rank, only on a minute cooldown, uh, you definitely get a lot of usage, uh, a lot of mileage out of it, but, uh, you you know, you're saying, of course, a hard counter uh, Spectre. Well, obviously, to Lifesteal as well. I mean, you know, getting that ensnare on them, even with Magic Community, but that one's the obvious one. I mean, that one... He, he's kind of, she's kind of always been really strong against him um, or anyone, frankly, that goes any magic immunity. But uh, I didn't even think of Riptide as far as the portability, but it really is with that armor reduction. And that's something that I feel like is underrated, but giving five armor reduction in a big AoE radius for sure, um, you know, definitely going to swing some fights. If you get her with uh, Vengeful or someone else that lowers armor, Shadow Fiend, yeah, you're going to start hitting like a truck with your team. I mean, that's the other thing, too. I mean, let's just even take, if you have it at rank 1, for le or level 1, pardon me, you have this 2 armor reduction. Wisp starts with 0. The heroes that are known for being tanky because of their armor, like the Night Stalker, for instance, start with 5, you're reducing it almost by half. It's pretty dramatic. And then... You know, just going off my earlier point, once you're able to start getting points in the mirror image, you're just able to spread that riptide around. You're also sort of now recouping this ability uh, to farm and farm more effectively uh, than some of the other supports. It wasn't really a fair comparison, but there was a game where you go, let's look at this Naga Siren and let's look at this Crystal Maiden. The Crystal Maiden was a 5, the Naga Siren was a 4, and able to actually get some money together. But it was just looking at the difference in the numbers. It's just like, wow, if Crystal Maiden had this amount of farm, she would obviously be stronger, but when you look at this Nagas Iron, who's like a support, has 1,200 health in the mid game, can reduce all this armor, and then can make mirror images that are going to wind up being able to soak damage and deal damage, like you really start to see where, let's just ignore the, the ensnare going through Magic Community, ignore the Song of the Siren, just between the Riptide and the mirror images where she can really start to contribute to the team in a way that a lot of other supports just can't. Right. Other, other supports are definitely dependent on more for their abilities late game, whereas she not only has that kit, but then she also, like you said, it, it has potential to assist with damage late game, and uh, that's something that you just cannot ignore as a fact. I mean, yeah, she's obviously not going to be nearly the potential if she had farm, but uh, definitely can still be a, a nice asset to have on your team regardless, uh, especially if you go something like a Heaven's Halberd, because she'll soak up that damage even better with that evasion. Um, and get that, maybe the slow procs with everything else. I mean, uh, 
just in general, very, very handy. So I love to have her. I loved ha- seeing her. And it's funny that we, we loved seeing her, like you said, it's, from TI2. It, it's literally the polar opposite of TI2. It's, you know, as we've just said, it's it's not the wombo combo. It's just a tool in the kit. It's not the carry. It's the support. It's not this thing we dread seeing. It's this kind of refreshing neat. Now, that's for now. That might that may back off if we keep seeing this yeah. trend. <laughs> um, and and this really sort of goes into maybe uh, the finals, but um, the biggest thing for me with the Nagas Iron is in TI two. It's this hero that's so strong. We need to do something about it. Ban worthy. Let's get it out. Um, this international something that is just present really through all of the group stages all of the the main event and once you get to the finals puppy ake banned out almost every single game i want to say it was every single game this is now not ti2 naga siren but the one that puppy would let through to everyone's dismay now naga siren is too strong to let into the game yep yep it's uh it's it's funny how that works and the nerfs that she received last time were to nerf her carry potential because it was the base damage right off the bat so it's gonna be hard for her to farm but she doesn't need to farm in this role so how then do you balance her in this regard it's gonna have to be a slam to her abilities again and it's going to be the abilities um uh i would say her last three abilities protect in particular in snare riptide or song of siren because you know, obviously, you 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 are not concerned with her late game carry potential. It's now about what she brings to that brings to the table for the team fights, and that's going to be a real tricky thing to balance. Really tricky. I I could maybe see cooldown increase on Song of the Siren, but I'm not sure. Uh, they're obviously going to have a lot to think about after this uh, after this tournament in general. <laughs> yeah, for sure, and that's definitely a discussion I want to have later too, because there's another here in particular that you're going to have to wonder. Uh, just how far into the ground is he bashed with the nerf stick? Oh, it's a because, he. It's a little... Well, it's an it. It's an it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, the other hero, though, that I think I want to get your input in on, the Timber Saw. Mm-hmm. He kind of goes ham, and uh, particularly in a lane that I know you don't like him, which yep. is why yep, 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 I thought yep, I'd yep, ask. Yep. What are your, your thoughts, your concerns? Saw. Well, I, uh... I've really, I've always, okay, I've always loved playing him, and I've, I think I made it clear in the last time we talked about him how middle plus Timbersaw equals a very upset J4Y. I mean, it, it's, it's just the fact that Timber Chain obviously is not going to be used. It's just not even, you literally don't even skill it until probably seven or eight. I mean, it's just so worthless for you. You get the reactive armor and the whirling death instead. Um, which obviously is fine. He he's able to get farm and he's able to tank up the harassment, which is like why I think people like him in the middle. Uh, and then you can even possibly push your lane with the whirling death enough to get rune control, depending on who you're against. So, yeah, I can see to a to a point where it's not a bad idea. But he's obviously trees is what gives him his potential, what lets him get his mobility and his burst damage. So, uh, I've always preferred him in a side lane, but you know, depending on your lineup, depending on how uh, much you can move him around, if he can stand up against certain heroes, then yeah. Uh, I mean, especially against melee. If he's against a Dragonite or something, he's going to have no issues. I, I, I actually like that a lot. That's fine. But when you're against like a Queen of Pain or a Puck, who easily can get uh, rune control, then I start having issues. Because once he starts getting low on mana... Farming's going to become a lot harder for him. And I feel like reactive armor is just not enough for the magic damage they're going to be laying down on him. Yeah, I can agree with that. I mean, I I think he sort of... If you're going to deal with him, you got to have to burst him down. But I the other thing I thought was really interesting about him in this tournament was he really was just popular out of nowhere. Again, it was one of those scenarios. And just immediately it's like, yeah, well, you know, he's kind of OP at level 6. Like, he does a little bit too much damage as soon as he's at level 6. And it's just funny, you have this hero that you hardly ever saw before this, and it's like, as soon as you start seeing him, you go, well, yeah, he's actually kind of stupid good. But we just weren't doing it before. Maybe everybody was just sort of holding on to it for the International 3. But um, 
you know, I guess that's really up to, you know, individual preference if you think that sort of thing is is maybe too strong, just being able to throw out that chakram and do a, a jillion damage at level six. But I mean you look at his kit, he's obviously he's kinda like a combination of Kotal and Clockwork to me. Because he's got the initiation for you. He'll get in the fight easily, disrupt it slow, do some nice burst damage. But he's also got the Kotal in the aspect of, uh, of counter push with Chakram. He could just throw his blade out there way far away, uh, not take too much mana to do it, and pretty much clear a wave out by himself uh, with a little assistance possibly. So he's really got the best of both worlds in that regard. And high survivability, throw that on top. Why not? He's a strength hero. He's uh, got a lot, of, uh, a lot going for him. I, so, I mean, I... I definitely get it, and I definitely you could see some aspects where his burst was just so immense with that true damage if you get that whirling death some with some some trees. Um, what I found interesting was the fact that Liquid in the losers bracket picked him twice on their best of one. They're like, you know what? We're so confident Bulba can play this hero mid that we're just gonna go for it. I mean, you would think they're gonna play their absolute best possible lineup in that best one in the loser's bracket because everything's on the line for their team and they were comfortable with Timbersaw so that's got to say something for the hero yeah for sure I actually just thought maybe it would be useful to have the, the, the stats for this guy uh, and actually I just found it 53% win rate uh, 19 picks 10 wins I mean yeah. pretty good when you consider Wisp uh, 56% win rate Right. So not really that far off. I mean, you know, certainly anything above fifty percent is pretty, pretty good. Um, but yeah, I I just love seeing him. I hope that he is a hero that carries on beyond the international three. And you know, it's just something else that we get to sort of look out for in the professional scene. Um, I have one other thing that I wanted to get your thoughts and opinions on before we sort of dove into the finals. Unless you have anything else that you well, want. there's. I mean, I feel like hit, I hit. wanted to touch on a certain hero. A certain someone? Someone that you might enjoy touching on. Ooh. Is it? Is it Lena? It is not Lena. <sighs> it's Riley. Oh. It's the lovely Crystal Man. She really had a nice presence, and I'll allow you while I'm talking to bring up her statistics as well, but uh, just how much she was picked up. I feel like it was more than I expected for sure. Uh, her speed's obviously still an issue. Um, that will always be her issue. But, you know, as far as the laning phase is concerned, she does a great job. We saw s so many games with those ultimates that decided the fate of the team fight. It was like, it was like witch doctor decision making <laughs> with that ultimate. It was like, wow, I want to play Skrillex's reptile theme song right now because it just made such a difference. In fact, there was one game with Liquid going, I believe it was their game against LGD China. This one I'm not 100% sure, but it was definitely uh, definitely in the Roshan pit with Liquid. And Fluff and Stuff just left to his devices to channel this ulti in the Roshan pit. Full channel annihilated the whole team. And while it wasn't given that much attention during the actual fight itself, if you go back and watch it, you say, oh wow, that was definitely the reason they won that fight. There was no question about it. And, you know, I'm not going to say the ultimate's the only reason you pick her, but it obviously could have a devastating uh, devastating uh, impact on a fight if you just left her alone, which we've said time and time again, but uh, I think it's shined through in this tournament. Yeah, I mean, she winds up going with a 50% win rate. Uh, Aki goes undefeated with her. Hmm. Um, although... I guess you could probably say that a lot of the heroes, maybe that Alliance on a pick and go undefeated. Yeah. But, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, she has some strong presence. It it was kind of it's the thing with like Venomancer too. Like, I used to love Venomancer to death, but then I sort of got to the point where it's like, you know, really, once you start getting to the later levels, Venomous Gale starts to fall off. It's you know, you can no longer take in the effect of like, oh, Gale is like one of the strongest level one spells there is. Um, eh. I, the Crystal Maiden, though, I mean, especially with the the buff to the alt, I, and the passive as well, I mean, I, I definitely enjoyed seeing her. Uh, I liked her a lot, and she was still able to 
produce, like you were saying, you know, in the big team fights, beyond the sort of aggressive trialing, beyond that sort of the first blood potential, and, and that's, of course, great when you get to see your sort of break the, the stereotype, the mold that you sort of fit her with. And Fluff and stuff going phase boots on her every time, thoughts? Yep. <laughs> yep. Makes a lot Pretty of good. sense. <laughs> It's the uh, it's the phase the bots or the tranquils maybe one of those is a little bit too expensive <laughs> to consider. I, I like it I like the idea but yeah probably not reasonable. Uh, you gotta get the heaven's halberd first. You just have to. I mean, that's, that's true. That's now the staple support item these days. And the eggs because <laughs> oh right eggs be nerf. You know you gotta hit all these. So. Oh right the upgrade. How could I forget? It's How just such you? a common <laughs> occurrence. <laughs> this day and age, um, so that's all I really about uh, heroes that I was. We were kind of surprised. I mean, do you really want to skip ahead to the grand finals, or do you want to get anything else in? Um, the one thing that I did want to get in um, was sort of, I guess, on the road to the finals. Right. Um, your your thoughts on the the quote unquote bugs of the the tournament? Something that got a lot of attention, mostly because one of them pretty much guaranteed Navi a victory in a very important match uh, against Hong Fu. Um, the two in particular being uh, working with Chen to send people hooking back to base, back into the fountain, that uh, the sixth man on the Navi lineup in that, that one game were basically teleporting Dendi who was hooking a gyrocopter with Aegis back into the fountain, won them the game. Um, and then also being able to send out your illusionary orb on the puck, go, uh, be sent back to base by Chen, have your bottle filled, and then jaunt back to your your orb. Uh, you know, What are your thoughts on one, both, either of those quote-unquote bugs? Do you think they're bugs, or what are your thoughts? Valve has confirmed that they're not bugs. Valve has actually made a statement, uh, at least about the teleport pudge hook, um, saying that as far as they're concerned at this point in the game, that they're fine with it being in the game, and they have no issue with it. Now, there, that doesn't mean it's staying, right? The, the armlet bear, that was something Valve addressed, saying we're going to see where this goes, and sure enough, they took it out. So, I mean, Valve's very aware of it, and... Um, it may down the road get taken out. It, it 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 probably depends on, I would say, how much of a strategy it really becomes. The armlet bear was almost every game, and I think that was the main reason they're like, you know what, we can't keep this in the game. It's too volatile. It's too ridiculous. But pudge hook, let's be honest, that's hardly ever even shaped up, and it 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 takes a lot of skill and finesse to pull off. It's not something you can just buy an item and it's op. You know, you've really got to get the timings down perfect, and the hook has to land. So I think, honestly, if a team can pull off a strategy like that, props to them. Let them play it out. Um, you know, because it takes not only vision, but just everything has to go come together perfectly. And not only if you fail it, now you're down a man. Pudge is not with your team anymore. He's got to run all the way back to wherever your team is. And we saw it happen a few times where he missed his hook. And now they're trying to defend t a tier two. He, they can't. He's now no longer there. They have to let the tower go because they failed the strategy. So it's kind of an, not an all-in, but it's a very, uh, you really need to land that to have success. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a gamble. I mean, I, I brought it up because not only were there a lot of people on the social media talking about it, but there was even an interview with a uh, puppy that I was watching just before this where he was sort of talking about it, and he was like, you know, that's, that is what won us the game. Yep. And um, I believe it was Epi who was interviewing him. He's like, well, you know, there was also some other stuff. And Puppy's like, no, that's what won us the game. And he even sort of admitted that he thought these were bugs. But they're there, so you're in this tournament for you know, a huge prize pool. You're going to use what's at your disposal. The other one that he mentioned that um, I thought was interesting is uh, a quote-unquote bug was Visage. And just how those familiars can't be stunned. They can only be killed through through damage um he thought that that was pretty much what makes visage you know first pick worthy it's just the fact that those familiars can get in and get out and you just have to right click them down and that's really the only way to try and deal with them now obviously not a bug but um definitely incredibly strong you're right he was a first pick first ban um very very often if not every game to be fair um you know it 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 takes an immense amount of micro to to use that hero to its full potential. We've we've said that time and time again. 
Um, but obviously, his damage output is nuts. Even early game, you put him in a tri lane, you're going to get that soul, soul, soul Rip to do a bajillion damage uh, game over. But the ultimate late game is where he shines. It's where you get that initiation with the stuns, set it up. You can do AoE stuns back to back without even anagonyms. To back. Um, <laughs> yeah. To, ba and then potentially to back, the third back could happen. Uh, if, right, you have enough farm. But uh, even still, it, it, it definitely is something something, uh, something to be considered. I, I don't know, though. I, I believe if you were able to CC them, then he all, he all it would be a lycanthrope. It would be just, he's out the door. He's gone. Be, I, I believe uh, just because of the fact of the bounty and the cooldown. They're, they're a super long cooldown, and they give a good amount of money. So if you could CC them, they would be very hard to use well. You would have to, because their vision is very low, so you'd have to be ready, and I, I, I don't think that's a change that they're ever going to make to those. Fair enough. Uh, how about we get in these finals, then? I want to. I think. I think there's one more thing we should do before oh we get the finals. Oh my god! We should just mention. I'm gonna just mention the results of some of the other parts. Okay. Just so people are aware. So the prelims, <laughs> the group stages, uh, how it ended up going. Group A, Navi winning it 11 to three, being the top. And this is another thing I wanted to mention: Western domination. This whole tournament, may I just say, Western domination was kind of a theme. Now, yes. Asian and Chinese teams did play a part, and we'll get into that later, but um, the, t the top two teams were Western teams, which obviously drastically different than TI2, where I believe it was like six of the top eight or five of the top eight were Chinese slash Asian teams. Uh, so in this case, uh, there was only, f well, four Chinese teams were the top eight. Which it doesn't sound that much less, but they weren't even they didn't have nearly the records. Uh IG ending eight and six. They were your champions last year. Uh Tong Fu and Orange, eight and six. Alliance fourteen and 0. Undefeated. That is a number. That is a number. Uh, uh of course the only other team to do that was LGD China back uh last year. And LGD China going eight and six this year. Fnatic nine and five. Uh who actually started out uh, I believe they were eight and two up till one of the final couple days, so they were on a just a roll. They two owed Navi in their first series. Navi, that was the only team to two owe them. The rest of the tournament they were winning except for one game, uh, and then DK ten and four. So everyone else on the bottom. Oh, I guess the other team I should mention and give a poor little shout out to MUFC zero and fourteen. They gave it their all. I hope not. If that was their all, that. <laughs> That was a sad, sad day. Um, even Rattlesnake, the wild cards, end up going 3-11. and So at least they, they got a few wins under their belt, you know. They, they could go home with a little pride uh, in their I staff. mean, you know, that's a team that came to the International with, like, no manager, right? I mean, like, <laughs> when you consider the sort of competitive teams they're stacking up against and the fact they were able to do that well, I mean, I think it says something at least, you know. Um, it's just sort of nice to see that, I mean, yeah, they didn't make it very far, but this team of guys that wind up just being able to go to this tournament and can stack up against some of the, the bigger dogs and uh, outperform a at least one of them and tie for another. <laughs> right. No, exactly. It was uh, it was something else. Uh, I, I believe Liquid actually did pretty well. I don't remember what place they ended in, but they got money. So <laughs> at the end of the day, that's, that's what it comes down to, right? Getting, getting, getting the money uh, is very nice to have. And I think a stat, too, that I think is certainly worth mentioning that you might not be able to just sort of uh, appreciate um, on in the wins and the losses is Orange, who I think just performed phenomenally, and then also wound up having players that had the most number of heroes played. You look, of course, at some heroes, some players that have like the one or two heroes, they're sort of their go-tos, and you know, you look at Havost, who winds up playing Alchemist just all day, every day. Yep. Um, the fact that Orange were able to be so successful playing so many different heroes um, on so many of their players, I think is just uh, amazing and fantastic, and I love seeing it. Belinda gave us a little uh, feedback. Uh, Mushi used 18 different heroes, and Extinct used 16 heroes. So, wow. 
That's a, that's that's a good amount of selection coming out from just two of their players alone. Uh, you know, and like you said, I mean, let I mean, Dendy, I could probably count easily on one hand his top five, and then the rest, yeah, he could play other ones, but he's gonna most likely play those five over and over and over. Whereas, you know, you give these other players credit, they're gonna just throw so much at you. But you know, I, Dendy probably wasn't the best comparison because he actually mixes it up more than most mids do. But um, Pudge, Pudge alone, that's all I have to say. One name and you're like, oh, Dendy, no other team, <laughs> ever. <laughs> Which is surprising that no other team likes to take that risk, but he is a risk. That is for certain. That is 100%, <laughs> yeah. But it was nice to see him, them, them execute it pretty well though throughout this tournament, that Pudge. But, um... Oh, I mean, Orange, you got to give credit to, and I, I agree. I mean, they ended up, and since we're going to go into Grand Finals, I can just say Orange ended up third place. Uh, t I would say most of the community giving them no credit to get that far at all. Uh, and the fact that they went through the loser's bracket beating out teams such as, uh, let's see here, shall we? Uh, well, Dignitas, uh, poor Canadian-American brothers getting out there. But then they beat Fnatic, they beat DK, they beat Tong Fu. I mean, powerhouse teams that were just seeming to just dominate most teams they played. And Orange came out on top. Uh, and they still won $287,000. So not too shabby for third place. I could live with it. I think I'd be okay with could that. Could you? Could you? I think, you know what? We did all right, guys. Pack it in. Let's go home. Let's, uh... <laughs> Drinks are on me. I mean, I think apparently MVUK is telling us that Orange picked Slaughter on one, and he thinks they deserve to win TI four and TI five for that. Yeah, the Slaughter pick was so genius. I had completely forgotten about that, but oh my gosh, I love seeing that Slaughter. It was beautiful. I mean, and that's the thing too. I mean, that's probably something that they practiced, but I mean, just you get to see that hero, and you're just like, yeah, this is. What happened to this guy? Why isn't he used? Especially, again, because, you know, we saw DK being such a, a huge hero, and that's obviously a great way to try and cripple him. You have all these supports that wind up building the um, Medallion of Courage. I mean, another great way to try and tear through that when it's not being used um, as an activatable. I mean, I really, as soon as I saw the Slardar, and you look at the other team, and you just go, yep, great choice. Let's see if they can make it work, and they did. How do you think Eternal Envy feels right now? This is a um, side note, but how do you, you, know, do you think he was? Do you think he was uh, just cheering against them every single game of the way, or do you think he was like, you know what, they were my brothers at one time. I want to see them do well. You know, I like to to be naive and hope that people have goodwill and nothing but cheer and peace to spread to their brothers. <laughs> if it was I me, I'd tell you, I know what I would be doing. I would be <laughs> like. Every single game, like, okay, Lowe's going to do this. You guys should definitely be able to counter this strategy. Oh, God, come on. How would you let them get away with that play? This is ridiculous. And when they went 14 no, I'd be like, just just turn off the computer and walk away. Just walk away. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, you know, to be honest, I feel like if he's able to find himself a stable team, like, I'm looking forward to seeing whoever he brings with him to the tournament. I mean, we look at how Mouse Force was able to do, and, you know, I was kind of talking with some people. I'm just like, you know, I don't know. I, I wonder if Cinder and Stay is really kind of over, if he sort of had his, mm. his chance in the limelight. But, you know, Eternal Envy, we talked about sort of the drafts he's able to put together and, and some of the ideas he has, and I still feel like, you know, he might not ever be able to take a team to the finals of the international, but I definitely just enjoy watching games that he's a part of, so... I want Cinderin to do what Melk's doing. I think... I think uh, he's a good player, no doubt, and he can keep playing if he so chooses, but he's got so much game knowledge that I feel like he could do just as well. When he casted with Toby, it was an amazing matchup, because not only did their personalities get along, which is important, but his in-depth knowledge of what teams were going to do uh, making predictions was just phenomenal, and I, I would love to see more analytical things coming from him because he's not only fun to listen to, but he's a he's a really intelligent, great guy. Yeah, definitely. I think he brings a just a good persona to that that whole thing, and just right. um, yeah, like you said, I've always certainly enjoyed when he's casted with Toby and stuff. So you know, hopefully, we'll get to see more out of him in that respect, but. You know, like you said, more power to him. He wants to keep going back to these internationals. It's great to see that he is a regular there and can keep right. going to compete. Somehow. 
gets there either through playing or <laughs> however he does it. Uh, and he keeps sneaking in, I feel like, by the just barely getting into these tournaments. I believe the last two times it's been a team that hasn't been uh, convincingly a part of the, the tournament, but um, which is unfortunate for him. But, uh, you know. You get uh, points for being there. We need more Yule's Night Stalkers. Can I just say that? We need Missed more the, Yule's Night Stalkers. It, it was mentioned he was there in spirit in uh, Game 4 of the Finals. Let me tell you, that was that was mentioned. Yeah. But, on to the Finals? I think we're finally ready. I think the single greatest part of the Finals of this tournament, Navi versus Alliance, is again, I, I found this like so funny last year, where you have the team that won the first time uh, is like the Cinderella story. Like they're the ones that are sort of like the underdog coming into this, going up against the Alliance, who just put on such a performance. Like you said, going undefeated in the group stages. Um, they sort of again wind up being the underdog coming into um, the finals. They wind up losing it, but holy crap, was that an amazing series? Those are probably some of the greatest finals that we'll see in a, a long time and what is the most amazing about this this whole thing in general was the first four bands I want to say every single game Darkseer, Naga Siren, Lifestealer, and Chen the sort of respect bands the heroes that can be brought to just the next level by phenomenal play are the heroes that wind up getting banned out here Batrider, Io, these were let through. We let's try and deal with them every single game. I mean, Io actually goes undefeated through the finals, which is something for later. Don't worry, we're gonna get to that. But it's these heroes that really the players are able to just be phenomenal at that wind up getting banned. Especially the Chen. I mean, all of these heroes are of course strong and fantastic, but to me it was like, wow, you guys aren't banning these heroes because they're too strong. We can't play against them. We don't feel like playing against that strategy. It's just like we're going to deal with the Imba heroes because we respect this other team as players so much that it's the players that we're going against. It's the players that are able to bring uh, you know, this phenomenal energy to the game and this phenomenal potential. We have to play against the players and not necessarily against the game like sometimes it feels like teams are doing. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this draft for just the first game, and the heroes that are allowed through the bat rider, like you said, Visage, uh, Io, and Nature's Prophet. I would say uh, three of those four heroes, some of the highest win percentages already in the tournament, knowing how strong they are. And the fact that they were allowed through just more uh, gives concrete evidence to what you're saying, backs it up that uh, they're more trying to ban out the players themselves and not necessarily what's strong in this meta currently. Because uh, it's going. They, they, they didn't get there by playing the meta correctly. The teams got there by being amazingly strong players. And, I, you know, uh, I, especially against Na'Vi. I mean, let's just throw it out there. Na'Vi, definitely known to throw a lot of these kind of strategies out there. Quantic might be one of the only teams that go a little crazier than them. <laughs> but, uh, and Kai P, but. You know, we don't have to get to that, but uh, you know, and you know, give Alliance credit, they do like to run some unconventional things on their own as well. But um, I'm not sure if Phantom was Phantom Assassin picked this tournament by. No, nope. I don't. Oh, well, it might have sure. been in the tournament, but not in the finals. Definitely not in the finals. I, I know that was uh, Gyrocopter, Hem and Loda, uh, you know, kind of his signature hero throughout. But um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. In this first game, I guess we'll probably just briefly touch at least on some of these games. Some. You don't need to go into much detail because they were such a blowover. But uh, Navi's lineup, why? Can you just walk us through that a little bit? Undefeated, first of all. There's stat number one. Uh, that that strategy had been tried before. They even talked about it uh, between the games. But, I mean, this is sort of, I think, a point that sort of goes into the rest of this um, best of five, the series, and something that, again, a, a great milk quote, um, aggressive tri-lanes just aren't working. It seemed like this whole series, there was just no way that teams could get them to work. And this game one is a great example of it. Puppy on the Venomancer, Havost on the uh, Vengeful Spirit, and Kuroki playing the Visage. These teams, this tri-lane goes up, and they're like, yeah, we're going to go against the other tri-lane and we're going to win, and it's going to be great. They wind up going against Nature's Prophet, and they can't do anything, and it generally falls apart. They wind up 
spending time farming on these heroes when you're like, these are the times that they should be going crazy. What They weren't able to... I mean, clearly, that lineup is meant to get kills, and they weren't able to get that going. I mean, Admiral Bulldog played against that lane, played against it. He didn't even abandon it. Um, and didn't feed, didn't die. And then if you want to look at the other side of that coin, you wind up having, in the fifth game, you have Havos, solo bottom, against the tri lane, the Wisp of CK, makes them pay for every kill to start that off. I mean, just amazing jukes through the trees behind the towers. The tri lanes, the aggressive tri lanes just weren't producing in this best of five, and, and that's kind of something that I'm really interested in looking forward into tournaments after this. What do teams take away from that? What do they take away from the fact that there was so much failure on the part of being able to contest the farming lane? Yeah, exactly. I It, it definitely... Uh it's 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 definitely a tricky thing that teams have to figure out, and it really depends on I guess the teams that, or I'm sorry, the lineups they pick, especially for that off lane. Uh, you know, if they go the heroes like the Nature's Prophet, like uh, Dark Seer, like heroes that obviously, or Bounty Hunter, ones that don't necessarily have to just stick there, and uh, get the experience and farm, but they can instead roam or do something else. Right then, what do you do? Do you why would you even bother going these aggressive trials? You're obviously only hurting yourself in both levels and uh, and gold farm. So uh, it definitely makes you have to adapt your strategy. And uh, yeah, that first lineup was just it was such a powerful tri lane. I mean, there was no questioning. If if it went head out, head on with any other lineup, they they probably would have dominated it. But obviously, when you're looking at it as a line, you're like, well, screw that. What? A, why would we even bother? That's not worth our time. And uh, we know late game, we're going to easily outscale them. You know, so w what's what's the what's the purpose? But obviously, it didn't even get to late game. But uh, yeah. I guess that's just the thought process. And, you know, that was kind of another thing, too. Like, that was almost like the textbook of why I am, in general, not very sure about how I feel about Venomancer. Because it was, like, clearly... You pick that up because of Venomous Scale, because of the kill potential there. And you go, hey, Vengeful Spirit, uh, this hero that is great for pushing, obviously. You have Venomancer with the wards, that's cool. But you looked at how long it took them to take down that Tier 1 tower. I mean, it was 6 to 7 minutes, I believe, which doesn't seem that long. But who's stopping you? You have nothing stopping you. It's a nature's profit trying to slow you down, and you can't, you can't do it. Like... Venomancer was really just doing nothing there. He wound up at one point in the game towards the end trying to farm the Ancients. And, you know, that's just not what Venomancer's for. Like, that's past his window of opportunity. And that was something I think was really clear and apparent in just the analysis as well. Like, the window of opportunity for Na'Vi was just over so quickly that they just really weren't able to do anything with it. Right, and it, it they clearly... <laughs> Clearly showed through a, a quick performance, and uh, game two also a pretty quick performance. Um, but the uh, tables turned, you might say. Uh, Navi doing all the work in that one. As it turns out, Avos pretty good at last hitting. Huh? That's what we learned. I don't know why we didn't know that before. <laughs> right. But we've learned it. And Vita Bancer, this is obviously uh, the nail in his coffin. Um, <laughs> this game because he gets picked for Alliance and. Uh, well, it doesn't have the most fruitful of games as well. So, uh, but yeah, Navi going, of course, Alchemist. Getting back to basics, if you will. That first game was kind of like, maybe they figured, well, hey, this is a best of five, and worst case scenario, we lose the first game, we tried it, let's get back to our roots. And boy, did they go back to their roots with that Alchemist-Wisp combo. Yeah, I mean, I if we want to talk about that for a second, just, you know, what do you think of that lineup in the first game? I mean... I think it's just, it's fine. Like, that, if you're going to have a game to mess around in, it's going to be game one. And, of course, you know, I think Alliance has just been showing up to play, really, like, that whole tournament. Like, if you can try and catch them off guard, that, hey, man, if it works, you're a game up. If you lose, then, yeah, you're a game down. But, you know, clearly both of these teams, no matter how that works out, have the capability of coming back. I mean, the game, too, yeah, it's just they left Havos alone. And what are you going to do? I mean, he was just able to get an absurd amount of farm and was able to just carry the game from that. I mean, yeah, you wind up getting, like, the Imba combo together. You wind up having Kuroki on the Wisp and uh, Dendi on the Bat Rider. They were just making the plays in the middle lane, being able to pick up um, some really phenomenal-looking kills. Um, 
it, it was just sort of uh, weird to see those two heroes actually in a game on the same team. And you know, the the other, I think the supporting heroes in this, the bounty hunter played by Funic and uh, Puppies Enigma. I mean, those heroes we don't get to see a ton anymore, but really making a big impact and even caused bounty hunters to be banned um, in one of the later games. Well, bounty hunter obviously uh, is another one that kind of has an influence on the pace of a game um, more so than other ones. Just because of track, of course, that is his uh, his uh, well his staple, his what he's known for, and uh, getting just just a few track kills even early on, giving that extra gold to everyone involved. It just can obviously make such a night and day difference for your team getting those get, you know a, a lot of supports especially but in general getting just a couple hundred gold off either upgraded boots or maybe this next set of wards or something uh now you got it because of this bounty hunters track and obviously funic playing that hero immensely well knowing how to roam effectively and get those tracks up for the kills uh and then poppy on enigma which I don't know why I was surprised to see it, because he's obviously an amazing jungler. He's proven that time and time again. But you just... Enigma in general, obviously, has just fallen off in recent times. And for some unknown reason, really, because he just got, I, I would say, buffed, if anything, in this pr last patch, getting that uh, the stuns to be... Well, you get the three stuns right away. Um, but definitely making his presence known and those black holes early it's okay to waste use it on one hero because you're going to guarantee a kill especially if you can put like a track up on that hero oh that was totally worth the investment of time and money and like you said Havor's getting all the farm on the alchemist just sealed the fate for that game yeah i mean um i thought it was just uh in general like just a clinic of what can happen when you get way too much farm on an alchemist? Why it's so hard to try and leave him alone? Can but you just briefly touch on how alchemist IO just the overcharge on him is so stupid good? I I wanted to bring that up. I was gonna wait, but that's okay. We can do it now because there is one image burned into my mind of Havos just fisting a Rex, uh, and you know Alliance is trying to go to town on. They're trying to put up the damage and like oh alchemist he's just too tanky and you're just like dude that's that's io overcharging and that's the whole reason like yeah of course getting the items is important but you're just like that that percent damage reduction is just huge when you have that kind of a hero who's just about being up in your face doing tons of damage being survivable and now you're going to add overcharge on top of that like what are you supposed to do um and, you know, that's, of course, I think going to be great to incorporate into our conversation of uh, how does I nerf bat later on. Right, and Alchemist, obviously, one of his his weakest points is his armor. So he's he's a he seems like he's a he's a big brute, but really he's he, he's kind of vulnerable in the sense of his armor. But when you give him that flat damage reduction, that's sort of not such an issue with him anymore, especially some of the ways we've, we've seen him. Uh, play when he has that IO, he just likes to go even more health and more damage, and he's fine with it because you know at the end of the day he'll survive through with that overcharge on him. So um, yeah, I, I definitely that combo, and I remember exactly what you're talking about where he's just beating on the buildings. They're trying to do everything they can to him, and it's just not enough. And uh, and uh, I would say Wisp in this case, I mean yeah, the relocate was definitely used, especially with like the Ursa combo when that was going on, but. In general, in these games, it wasn't necessarily he was picked for relocate at all. It was more for that late game, uh, the overcharge, and of course the the tether. I think really came through. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the the, the game that I think I had the most fun with was the alliance pocket strat that we wind up uh, seeing in round three fight. Uh, the ogre magi uh, lone druid combo. Oh yeah. What do you think? I I was so thoroughly, thoroughly confused when we first saw that draft. I was like, what are those blue heads doing in this game? Like, I, I just could not figure it out. How stoked were you for the the Ogre Magi in the crowd, though? Because that guy that lost guy was his beast. mind. Yeah, that guy it was, was awesome. Uh, it was... Uh, it was it was cool, and I I was I was I was probably asking for that hero to get picked up in this tournament somewhere along the way, but... Uh, I never expected it to be 
on this lineup, and I now I've learned a lot. Once again, this has been a great eye-opening experience because, like you said, picked with the lone druid. That's the key point here. Using that bloodlust on that bear just lets it go ham sandwich on towers, on heroes. You name it, he's gonna get it uh, with that attack speed. Get those those uh, either the root procs or his extra bonus damage to towers. Either way. He's well, quite literally a beast, but also just doing plenty of damage, and it 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 was uh it was interesting, for sure. I mean, it, this is like almost felt like a David and Goliath type game. I mean, you have of course the IO and the Visage, and the Alchemist for Nas and Sari, but this pocket strat Ogre Magi Lone Druid has been really successful in the past. There was a, a small stint of time where I saw this a couple times in a row, and you're just like, wow. That's awesome. <clears throat> you throw that with the Bat Rider, just him getting bloodlusted. You have Marana to Perma Smoke Alliance, pretty much. That's super low cooldown. And then you have high burst damage from Lena. I looked at that and I'm like, I'm just so scared for Navi. How are you going to be able to contest this? They didn't have a huge amount of counter push. I mean, you have Acid Spray, you have Fade Bolt, you have um, Unstable Currents from Razor mm -hmm. um, to be able to help try and slow down the creeps and deal with them, but just the amount of push potential that they had. And you look at Admiral Bulldog, who has almost a 90% win rate and almost 100 games played on Lone Druid, just like, this is this is it. This is the dream team. This is a win for Alliance. Not so fast, because Navi was actually able to, to pull it together and, and put it up a W. And the other very exciting slash important thing to talk about this game was the fact that Dendi played Io mid. Uh, something that you do not see very often in general. Now, uh, I remember actually when Io got in the game and I watched Purge play him, he played him mid and he just kept going on and on about how that was his favorite, absolute favorite place to play Io because you get that quick six and you are just all of a sudden all over the map with your team setting up kills with the tether and your spirits and really causing devastation. That's exactly what he did. He went around after six. He he did okay in farm. Of course, he was against Lone Druid mid, and uh, Lone Druid you, you would expect. In fact, he got first blooded uh, just from a from a RNG proc. But still, he hit six, and he was able to come around the map with that teller and set some nice early kills for his team, and uh, really. I, it's just it's such a cool thing to see these kind of heroes played in, in a different light. Yeah, I mean, I want to say I remember LD saying that uh, Dendi actually believed in, you know, the viability of Io mid and how he's sort of underrated in that position. And I mean, I, it's sort of one of the, those things, of course, that we always say, you know, oh yeah, supports are great because they don't necessarily need items. When they can get them, it's awesome. And you look at just, if you're able to secure Wisp not only levels, but also a little bit of farm. Like, even just having, like, mech, being able to transfer some of that heal through the tether, um, the earnest shadows, being able to pick up these very basic items means the world to Io. And so being able to see him in that position, I think it was great. It was something that maybe caught Alliance a little bit off guard. Obviously, they were ready for it. They were able to send that uh, lone druid middle, but... Um, it was just a really great game. It was a fun one to watch, too. I mean, really, all of these were just, I, I think, fantastic. Right. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was an exciting game, to say. It, was, uh, it definitely had its back and forth moments, but clearly uh, the, the, the bloodlust was just not enough for the Havorst Alchemist once again, proving too darn strong. And what, like we even talked about last uh, time with the overcharge <laughs> combination, too darn strong. What did you think about uh, seeing number 83? Were you yep. expecting Night Stalker to be the 83rd? Absolutely not. Not in, uh, I'm not going to say a million years, but... An, an epoch. Sure. Let's use that one. Uh, in an estuary. I don't know why I said that word. That's mm, to do with this. Which, cool. by the way, I learned is the uh, location in which fresh and salt water mixes. So now everyone take that home with you tonight oh. or wherever you're going on the way with your podcast. <clears throat> that being said, so game four, as you say, it's S4 playing the Night Stalker mid. Um, and this game also had some interesting, uh, interesting things about it. I looked at Navi's lineup when they drafted. They had Puppy on the Bane, Havorst on the 
on the Alchemist, Dendi on the Puck, Kurakai on his Rubik, and Funic on Batrider. They were playing some of their staple heroes. I would say four of those five, you know, Puppy on the Bane, eh, I could use him on another hero, but it's still a good choice. Uh, I'm like, how are they going to not do wonders with this lineup? Yet, eh, it ended up just snowballing out of control with Night Stalker, and that's exactly the type of hero he is. Once he gets on a roll, he is hard for him to stop. Yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, he's definitely one of those mid heroes that functions like that. And um, you know, again, this is where you sort of bring up the the Night Stalkers of old, the uh, Cinder and Night Stalker with the Yule Scepter, um, blowing one target up in the air so that you can focus on another. Um, you know, we saw a super aggressive Night Stalker that was able to. Uh, really go around to the lanes contest it had a very productive first night time and to be honest the thing that I found most surprising about the Night Stalker pick was that this was the first time we had seen it um, you know the Storm Spirit is one of those classic heroes that we remember from the International One Days who actually got to see some light uh, on this tournament but the fact that it took this long to get Night Stalker out I, th I thought was kind of funny I really wouldn't when I saw him picked I'm like oh yeah him again but then they're like oh this is number 83 you go Weird. Okay. Cool. Cool. But I mean, it's it was a great reminder of of what Night Stalkers can do, and then another great reminder of maybe what I guess I would consider one of the l less popular builds going for that armlet. I almost always feel like uh, I think of the trademark Cinder in you know Yule Scepter build, but then I'll think about the Agnims and being able to get that global control, um, picking up the AC and then getting a gem and just running around dewarding everything and winning fights left and right, but here we saw a Night Stalker with an armlet going for that BKB and just started tearing people down, winds up going 11, 2, and 9, and I mean, really made a great case for why that hero is super viable still. Yeah, I mean, uh, when they go those other bills that we mentioned, like the Aghanims and uh, whatnot, it's generally more, he's more utility-based in the later parts of the game. You know, you're using him as a function rather than a source of real good damage, um, and you know, with a snowball, the start he gets, and especially in this game, uh, he used it in a different method. They decided, you know what, we could build you that way. I mean, they had plenty of damage. They had Gyro, they had Wisp to buff him up, and then they had Nature's Prophet. So you know they had damage, but getting that third source of a real potential threat, making allowing him to go in there, not only use his Void and his Silence, which obviously are massively annoying on every level, which is what lets him get there in the first place. Uh, now you have that toggle, which actually in a couple even saved his hide, being able to toggle that on and off, and making him that much more of a nuisance. Really brought together, I think, allowed them to come out on top in such a, a quick fashion. Um, and I just want to also point out how I love how it's really a counter to Dendi's Puck. Getting that silence on the Puck is the most lethal thing you can do to him. Because if he can't phase shift, if he can't cast his orb to get out, he is squishy as all hell. And, uh, you know, just get a nice three or four second silence on him, that is surely plenty of time for the rest of your team to follow up and kill him. And that happened on many occasions. Yeah, I mean, you can just see the stats that uh, many of the Navi heroes had, and really the only one with a notable gold per minute was Alchemist. So I actually managed to wind up beating the, the gyrocopter played by Loda. Um for the gold per minute, but I mean, just really crushed in the early stages. You see the supports. I mean, 0 and 5 Bane, 0 and 8 Rubik, 2 and 4 Puck. I mean, not necessarily to their fault, but just because this Night Stalker, that's what he's for. He's that hero that's supposed to crush those spell dependent, squishy heroes, and that's exactly what he did and why that armor build is so great. And you see how he went from there, winds up picking up the BKB so that he can't be stopped, and then the Basher so that he can even help be sort of. Um, a utility hero in that sense of being able to stick on the alchemist, stick on these squishy heroes, pick them off, and then hold alchemist in place so the gyrocopter can do his thing and just cleave them all down. Yeah, I think that was probably one of the only issues with Navi's lineup is their real lack of auto attack damage. They had alchemist, but that was about it, and you didn't even have this time in IO to buff him up. You know, you had the Bane to do a lot of crowd controlling and whatnot, but besides that, you just, you really, this team focused a lot on hard CC. With Batrider and Bane, you had, yeah, Magic Community's not going to stop here. You're going to get through with a couple CCs, but where's your follow-up? If Puck's silenced, he's not helping the team. If uh, Alchemist, sure, he's left to do some nice auto attacks, but you look at the other side of the coin, Night Stalker, Gyro, Nature's, and Io, I mean, you're going to be 
dealing with massive amounts of auto attack damage, and there was no way they could keep up with it late game. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing, too. I mean, you see the Crystal Maiden pick, which I actually really enjoyed in this one, able to even get a, herself a BKB. I mean, they just had so much kill potential, it was really hard to stop. And, you know, again, so much mobility. You have Io, you have Nature's Prophet, you have Night Stalker moving so quickly at night. Um, I think it was really a beautiful draft. That was a really smart choice at the end of the draft to pick up that Night Stalker once you were seeing really how flimsy uh, Navi's lineup was after the Alchemist. Um, it's those things that I really enjoy. And again, like this is where you can really sort of take the, the whole, you know, Imba hero, like no too strong to play against out of it because it doesn't matter because S4 is going to pick up a Night Stalker and roll you over anyway. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's, it's one of these heroes you can't like ban against. I mean, you're not going to ban a Night Stalker, but of course you put it in the right hands and it's going to be super destructive. Right. So I have Nature's Prophet. Clearly two global abilities making things life very hard for Navi and uh, we'll get into game five soon but similar in that game as well um, I, I just I'm curious why you think Navi doesn't seem to ever or very often pick Nature's Prophet as a side lane do you think they just have for some reason in their mind that he's just not as strong a hero as uh, obviously teams like Alliance feel like he is no I mean I certainly think that they probably like his strength, but I feel like when you consider um, especially how effective Bounty Hunter was managing to be um, this game, I want to say when Alliance picked up their Nature's Prophets, it was relatively early. There might have been one or two games where he was picked later on. But um, I just, I don't know if that whole just having somebody not be a part of the fight, other than maybe who they're farming, is kind of their style. I mean, it was something I thought was sort of interesting about how Navi played this whole tournament. They're just sort of a team that we always, I think, categorize as being pretty aggressive. But as soon as they were on their back foot, they almost seemed to shut down completely, um, which I, I thought was just kind of interesting. And then, yeah, you're going to let heroes like the Nature's Prophet go. Um, I, I don't know if it's really to their fault, but... Uh, it is interesting that you bring that up. That that's really a hero that they didn't really seem to prioritize at all. Do you think it could also be playstyle preference? Like, Funic just not interested in playing the hero like Admiral is? Yeah, probably. I mean, you think Admiral Bulldog, you think Lone Druid, and you think... You think Nature's Farm Bot. That's <laughs> what you think. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you just think of these strong offlaners who are able to just sort of, you know, put up a presence beyond... I mean, I think even the, the right-click. I mean, just what he's able to do on the Nature's Prophet being able to split push. I mean, certainly he was making really smart decisions about what fights to be a part of and what fights not to be a part of. And then when he was able to play middle, he was you know, able to do fantastic there and, and really contribute um, in all of his games, of course, on the Lone Druid. But um, I, I would say it's probably more a style thing. Yeah, I, I, did, I just thought, wanted your opinion. We got to get into game five. This is too, This is too good of a game to not get in the getting the crazy depth about game five so it came down to a game five first of all we may, may we say first how time. awesome is that for a grand final first time like you said uh between alliance and not v i mean you are just on the edge of your seat at this point anyways the last two games being super exciting back and forth um navi versus alliance here uh, I've, I've said that I, I don't know why i repeat it, it is just in case is, you forgot those still. are the two teams still playing in the grand final believe it or not they didn't uh sub out there was no no switching, no subs. You look at these lineups, and there's so many similarities from this whole series. You know, Navi running uh, Funic on that Batrider again, Kirk on his Rubik, uh, Havorist on his Alchemist, Puppy on his Enigma, but then Dendi going, completely head faking everyone, going to TA as their last pick, um, and then uh, Alliance uh, deciding to run the Crystal Main again on Aki, uh, Puck going for the S4. Uh, Loda on Chaos Knight, another kind of, uh, not a head fake, but definitely not something he's been normally playing. Uh, Io on AGM, and then Admiral once again on the Nature's Prophet. So as I was kind of t uh, tilting my hat to, uh, you know, going that Io-Nature's Prophet combo again. So, yeah. I mean, do you want to just kind of, you want to go into thoughts, or you want to just kind of go over what kind of happened? I mean, I it, just from the picks, I, it's interesting that this is kind of the first time we really see that, just like, the, the wombo combo of the the, the io and the chaos knight mm -hmm. um and i think too 
th just seeing Dendi's TA, what I thought was most interesting about that too is you look at the old Templar assassins that would go phase boots, blank dagger, and then whatever they wanted from there. The sort of the new school Templar assassin, which was the uh, drums, power treads. Um, and now we see out of Dendi the, the phase boots and then into the, the BKB. And, you know, there was a while where TA was pretty much a, a Dendi staple. We wound up playing him a lot for a while, and it was great to see him do it again. Did so much work on that Templar Assassin, but what really, I think, blew my mind this game was just that bottom lane. And you consider it's a Crystal Maiden, Io, Chaos Knight lane, and a solo Alchemist is able to punish that. It kind of goes back to the thing that I found phenomenal about the whole series in the bands where it's not the Emba heroes, it's it's the players and I think it's even at the low level or just us playing casually I think there's so much of a, a want to just jump on oh you pick this hero we're screwed mm -hmm. what, what you know what did, what did you do now there's no way we can win it, it really does I think come down to players and of course you could give these teams whatever heroes you wanted and they would find a way to make it work and be able to pull out win so it was it was just so neat to see how much Havos was really able to get out of that bottom lane for just from moment one back against the wall. Oh my god, that first time they dove that tower and like you say, he came out, came away two for one, uh, getting the first blood even. And then also on another dive, mind you, this was a four man dive, uh, getting the Nation's Prophet to TP in. And he even went one for one on the next one. Uh, just the fact that he could juke around with the tangos and survive long enough and even charge up that stun to assist with the kill uh, by himself, like you said, I, I, it really did show a tribute to his skills and game knowledge. And, you know, he definitely gets slammed a lot, I would say, by the public eye for uh, feeding. You know, people say, oh, there he goes again. Typical Havoris, you know, going in with his Aegis and wasting it or something. But... He's obviously a very good player, and there's there's no denying that. And I think that's why you put him on a hero like Alchemist, where you allow that farm, that good mechanics, to really shine through. Um, the TA, everything just seemed to go so well for Navi off the start. Let's just say that. They really were starting to take control of the game very well. Uh, you know, De and Templar Assassin is one of those heroes, if you can get your phase boots up quick, and maybe get some more stats, like you said, a drum or something else along those lines, or another damage item. He went for a kind of early Chrysalis eventually, too, just to get that damage boost. But if you can uh, start snowballing up that burst damage with the meld, with uh, the refraction, you can easily burst down the supports, if not these other heroes, such as Puck, like I said, who is a squishy hero in the first place. Nature's Prophet, he's not going to be tanky. Uh, honestly, came out to be, I feel like, a really strong pick. And a great difference from their other lineup, um, now they have that damage threat that they were missing before. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's sort of like a, a dual carry kind of lineup, and I, I really enjoyed it. He was able to really do a lot. And, you know, uh, the S4, an amazing puck, an amazing oh, solo yes. hero, uh, player, and just... I think how much Denny was able to do in that middle lane because of that Templar assassin, you're like, I see, it's like, yeah, okay, I, you know, why don't we see this more? This is a really a great answer to this type of hero. Um, of course, he winds up making a number of uh, stellar plays on the puck. Mm -hmm. May or may not have altered the fate of the game. But um, it was just really nice, and again, sort of like the Night Stalker, you just go, yeah, why isn't this a thing? Why has this stopped? Why don't we see this more? And again, you know, I'm just sort of looking at the final items. Like you said, he winds up picking a Chrysalis, but, you know, off that, the drums, um, power treads, winds up going into a Yasha, sort of that typical build for back in the day, that sort of almost uh, speed demon, stats, Templar assassin. Um, to see him go for the Manta style and then the Daedalus, really interesting choices. And it's unfortunate it didn't work out. Here's actually a, a game that I'm actually looking at it again, where you wind up seeing your carry of the Chaos Knight picking up a, a Heaven Talbert. Just showing the true strength Just of the item. And also showing these teams and how much how much uh, they've thought ahead with their item choices. You know, three BKBs up on Navi against this heavily reliant on magic damage team. 
Um, and then, of course, the two Ghost Scepters coming out from Alliance members, um, you know, because you're against a TA and an Alchemist. So physical damage, obviously, is their strong suit. So, you know, some really smart item choices all around. But like you said, game-changing moments um, definitely occurred. Uh, the first one being people are going to throw it up to RNG, but there was a fight in the Roshan pit where they got Roshan so close, Navi did, and they wanted to finish it off after pretty much winning a team fight. And then he goes back in and gets stunned. And as he gets stunned without refraction up, here comes uh, a, uh, here comes Puck, here comes a couple heroes, and they take him out, take the Roshan kill and the Aegis. And right from that moment, the momentum just shifts absolutely back in the other direction. Up to that point, everyone's like, Kent, even the casters are like, is Navi going to do it again? Are they going to get their second win? This is looking so strong for them. And then right at that turning point, Things just start clicking for lines. Yeah, and I mean, you love, hate Roshan, you know, RNG strikes again, or what have you. That is probably one of the greatest, most epic team fights ever around that Roshan. It was so amazing to watch, and so much fun, such a nail-biter. Um, yeah, I mean, and it was cool, too. I mean, just a testament of how great this series was, too. You have that epic base race, basically, of Navi charging up the middle lane, and the the Chaos Knight IO combo on the top lane, Nature's Prophet bottom, runs into uh, the Radiant base to buy a, a level 3 Necro book to help try and push down the towers, because they just needed the buildings in order to contest the game. Um, you know, really just smart decisions all around, I think. You know, obviously Puck being able to uh, Dream Coil, three heroes stopping them from teleporting back and defending the base. Huge play. Th this whole bit, I think, was just great in just showing how uh, amazing these players were, what kind of plays they were able to get off, and then what kind of strategies they were able to weave to for the captains. Yeah, like you said, um, able to uh, adapt and see that they're losing the game gold-wise and experience-wise. They're getting pushed down mid. Hey, we have Nature's Profit. Let's send them split pushing. We're always going to do that. But Chaos Knight, and this is where this pick really gets interesting again. Uh, a carry known, yes, for his burst damage with magic. Sure, BKB is going to take that part, but his ultimate is another huge part of the equation. And it's most known, uh, most known for its pushing potential because those elutes are doing 100% of your damage. Um, and if they're yes, they're squishy. They take plenty of extra damage. But if they're not getting focused by heroes or anything, and they're just allowed to do their full damage, which they were in this case, absolutely going to destroy towers. And that's exactly what happened. He was left with Wisp, like you said, to push the lanes. Well, they ended up taking out towers at two different lanes, uh, and even some Raxes. And like you said, S4. <laughs> Couldn't have been more clutch, uh, catching heroes as they were TPing back, forcing a couple, I believe it was Puppy and Dendi, had to run all the way back from the enemy base to their own, wasting their TPs. And such a momentum shift alone, I said it started from Roshan, but it just continued on. S4 made a couple more plays throughout the games that were in similar in that fashion. But, you know, it wasn't like only him that won the game. It was Alliance as a team doing executing their strategy perfectly. Yeah, it, it was great. I mean, like I was saying with uh, the Admiral Bulldog, I mean, just the presence of mind to run into the base to pick up that Necro book because he knew that, that's, that that item would have such a huge impact and being able to try and push down those lanes. It was amazing. Uh, I, I cried much that I wasn't there to witness yeah. and to, uh, you know, just grab the nearest person and jump with them and just, like, enjoy the moment. Uh, but... You know what we gotta we gotta we gotta figure out now, Jay. It's us. It's up to us to problem solve, to fix Dota. Uh, how do you? What do you do with a hero that was able to be in the finals with a hundred percent win rate? That we say is so damaging to just the way that the game is typically played, which is why he gets banned out. And then when he's not banned, he winds up winning a hundred percent of the time. What are your uh, what are your thoughts? If only I was Ice Frog and you asked me that question. Mm. Um, that's a great question. That it really is. is a great, great question. That is very hard for someone to answer. When they're I'll say, designer. I think that we... It, it's one of those things where you're never really going to be able to obviously change them in a way that no. stops the relocate. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, if that's something that we were actually watching the game with uh, Bonk. He's like, you know, you can't do anything about it. It's not really something you can balance around numbers. You could always say, well, you know, you make the relocate duration lower. But it, it wasn't even really the relocate, I feel like, that did uh, most of the work this game. You know, like we pointed out, it really was a lot the overcharge, what that was able to do. And we've, of course, seen some tweaks to the, the IO and trying to, you know, how much he can heal people he's tethered to and decreasing the movement speed that tether gives. Um, but still, this hero just seems so powerful. It's, again, I think one of those things where, almost with the Razor, like, obviously Io did a ton of work, but it's not like it was just Io making these plays. It's not just that Io CK was teleporting around the map, getting kills, picking off Navi one at a time, and just getting such a huge lead that, you know, Navi couldn't do anything about it. It really was just... The strategy as a whole, involving the hero. That, yeah, that's what it came down to, right? It, it it showed it could work either way, either his global presence or even his individual presence with the alchemist. I mean, both are very strong potentials, and I, it the number tweaking I guarantee you is going to happen more. They're they're going to have to do they're going to have to throw that as, at least as a temporary solution. Figure out some some number tweaking, but you're right, they're not going to overhaul his kit. That's just who the hero is, and I mean. The fact that he's not getting banned in every game makes me think he's not broken. Because, well, I mean, Lycan was getting banned every single game. Um, so he was clearly broken. Io, I mean, it's sometimes hard to justify a support hero getting banned because you'd rather ban out maybe some of these uh, farmers or late game people that you don't want to deal with, but... I mean, if he's that valuable, like Visage was even getting banned, then maybe that's just part of the game. Either way, there's going to be four bans in the end of the game, and they're going to have to go to someone. So you can't say everyone's always overpowered, you know. Yeah, I wish I was able to find our our buddy Io in this list a little bit easier. You would think alphabetical order, right? It should be pretty easy, yeah, but it's no. two letters. Why not? Just... Uh... I know. I wonder if he's in here under W. Oh, he is. He's in here under W. Oh, 56% win rate. Shit. Um, gets banned and picked uh, 96 times, so actually less than uh, Visage, mm -hmm. but I'm going to go ahead and say that was the, okay, OD got banned and picked more than him combined, okay, sort of life stealer, but clearly one of these top heroes, uh, and Batrider, but uh, clearly one of these heroes and that sniper. is just so highly valued, and I mean, you sort of see why, you know, he's pick ban worthy. Um, I'm he just... He's more of a Western hero than an Eastern hero. Yeah, this stage for sure. Game. So maybe that's the numbers game is where you're coming with. Like Visage, all teams love that hero. So that, that didn't really now. make a difference. Now, <laughs> right. Now. He used to be a pretty Asian Eastern hero, but... Western yeah, I don't know. We should try him. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter because they're just going to lower his attack damage by 15 and buff... <laughs> his cooldown, and oh. he's just going to be a carry oh. next. I was going to say, it's going to be the opposite. They're going to yeah. raise his base damage and <laughs> make his cooldowns longer or something and be like, play him as a carry now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, or we'll just, he'll be that hero that we see like three times and be like, oh, Morphling, so good. Wait, where'd this guy go? <laughs> but either way, I mean, it, it was a fantastic tournament. Um, I'm, of course, stoked for next year. I'm going next year. This is Found it. I know I said I was going to before. It's happening. Nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to hitchhike there. I'm going to ride buses and trains. I will hold on to the uh, landing gear of an airplane as it oh, takes Jesus. off in a general direction of Seattle. I'm going. It's happening next year. That it's going to be dangerous. awesome. Well, I've seen it in plenty of movies, Jay. I feel it, like it probably it works. Go, it's completely safe. I've never actually seen it backfire in a movie. So that means it's okay. Not once. That sounds like a, I would love to join you um, if uh, if it's in the United States. I will be there with you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's outside the country. I don't know if I can make the same promise. Uh, another interesting statistic: uh, peak online concurrent viewership for Dota 2 Championships eclipsed one million, um, which was not the record. However, League of Legends still owns that, unfortunately, at one point one million. But close. A million viewers in general. Uh, not bad, not bad, and more uh, giving that validity to esports being a real deal. Um, you know, just 
allowing it to grow. And and that's think about that. That's a million people for an event that is not advertised on TV or on radios or anything. You know, it's purely through the gaming communities. And then think about um, all the pub, all the pub stomps around the world that are being organized. I heard about movie theaters getting rented out. I mean, it's just insane. And this is just for one video game, all these things happening. So that's how I believe esports really, and we kind of touched on it last time, but it really is becoming this uh, this snowballing thing that is only going to grow as the years continue. For sure. I'm definitely glad that we can be here doing our part, making this uh, podcast help it grow. But uh, I guess that's that's pretty much it, isn't it? I mean, do you have anything else to go over? Not really. It was uh, uh, it was really great. Absolutely, if you've missed games, which I know I did, uh, definitely go back. All the games are free to watch. Uh, you can actually go to Dota2.com, uh, go to the international page, and if you just click on uh, it gives you all the brackets, everything. You can click on view, and you can even click watch the game. It'll open up your client. You can watch it. Or there's even YouTube videos. I mean... There's so many easy ways to access this content. It's wonderful. Um, so I would definitely suggest you go at least watch the Grand Finals. Do yourself that favor. Um, but other series as well, definitely take a part in it. Um, and you know what else is is really easy to uh, to find and to watch all of uh, yeah. is the Dota On Demand podcast, huh. which can be found uh, at YouTube.com. Uh, it can be found on uh, Twitch. Slash it Dota On Demand. Slash Dota on Demand. Uh, Facebook, slash Dota on Demand. Uh, you can just give it a Google. You'll you'll find it. So go ahead. Please right. go back. Watch all of our episodes twice, three times maybe. Make sure they soak in. And you know what? At least join us next week when we have something else equally fantastic. Maybe not as equally fantastic as the International 3 to talk about. So go ahead. Play yourselves some fantastic games of Dota this week. We will see you next week.